Hello and welcome to another update. In this one, I'll be covering the latest developments from the front line. Starting out, we have fighting continuing all across the whole front line. If we take a look at the developments, we see that the Ukrainian forces continue their attempts at attacking throughout the whole Zaporizhia front, moving into the Donetsk front as well, especially in the southern parts, even starting some attacks by Uladar. So the Ukrainian forces are continuously attempting to attack all over the front line, except for Hulyaipule. So this begs the question, why is Ukraine refusing to attack from this position? So far, I have not gotten the answer, but I will find it. But essentially what we're seeing is that they continuously build up their troops. They are not launching the same armored convoy assaults as they have been. A week ago, they started announcing that the main push was going to come. And we have seen since then that the front line hasn't moved. This means that the Ukrainian main push is not there yet. They started an attempt where they increased the amount of uh, armored vehicles there is in one single assault. It didn't work. So now they're building up troops, building up, building up until they have enough troops to launch a major assault. How will that happen? When will it come? And so on. We'll take a look at that later. As for now, we see that the Ukrainian forces don't only just attack in the south, but also in the Bakhmut area, where they continuously attempt at fighting and catching Klitschivka, as well as Kordyomivka and Andreivka, here in the center between the two. However, they are so far stuck since uh, over a week ago. So essentially, for the past week, the Ukrainians have been unable to advance in these parts of the front line. And similarly, in the north, we see here that the Ukrainian forces continue attacking. However, here they have had more success than they have had in other parts. And this is mainly due to the fact that the Russian forces are afraid to commit. For some reason, they sent an offensive operation across the river line, captured a bridgehead across and had a lot of units across. However, these were just infantry from the Storm Sea units, which are former prisoners who have been trained by the Russian army and are incorporated into the Russian army. And these were sent across the river line with artillery support where they captured a few villages. However, since then, the Ukrainians have counterattacked and the Russians didn't send any reinforcements across. So the Storm Sea units are trying to hold their locations, positions with artillery support. But the Ukrainians have been able to push them back, however. But we also see some Russian activity, especially around Belorivka by the Siversk front. According to the latest news, the Russian forces are continuously pushing in this direction and they have allegedly captured some defensive positions. However, the area around Belorivka is very interesting because there's been a lot of fighting back and forth where both sides capture territory and retreat from these territories consistently throughout the past over half a year since the end of last year. And here we're just seeing continuous fighting back and forth. And here I'd like to give one thing for the Ukrainian commander in this area on the Seversk front. He is and seems to be the most capable Ukrainian commander. As, as far as I know, the Ukrainian forces here have been able to hold their locations since the front arrived at this point. And they have been able to push the Russians back and hold a stalemate in this area. When comparing that to essentially every other place across the front line, the area which has seen the most success for the Ukrainians is definitely the Seversk front. And at the same time, we don't see any destroyed armored convoys. We don't see any uh, major graveyards in the Seversk area. In comparison to all the other areas, Seversk seems to be the one with the least casualties and the most success. However, similarly, we also have Russian forces who managed to uh, perform well and that we see in the Zaporizhia front with the fortifications built the Russian forces have been able to withhold and withstand the Ukrainian offensive for two months now the Ukrainians have managed to capture six or seven villages but that is about it they have managed to advance towards the first line of defense but the fighting is still taking place by the minefields and the first uh, send alone trenches ahead of the first formal line of defense so the Russian forces here have been able to successfully hold back the Ukrainian forces for two months now. So they are also performing uh, very well in comparison to other parts of the front line. And when I say other parts of the front line, I mainly mean two areas, which is the Uledar sector as well as the FDFK sector, where here there has been 
good moments and very bad moments for both sides where in the Uladar sector we had seen a major failure of the Russian army where they tried to capture the city but failed substantially and similarly we have seen the Ukrainians attempt some operations especially around the Avdivka and Donetsk area in general where they have seen some major failures but similarly we've also seen the russians have major failures in these areas not to say it is always failures for both sides they've also seen some success but no major success there's been no capture for any major villages there's just been a grinding down battle of attrition from day one until now and even saying that is wrong because it's been ongoing since 2014 there's just been a stalemate here and there's nothing but that so militarily speaking the ones who have actually attempted and succeeded with something is especially the southern part of the russian army as for the ukrainian army it is mostly the siversk part of the front you could argue that uh, the Kherson and kharkiv offenses were major success However, from my perspective, the fact that they ended up dwindling their offensive power and did not receive a, a refurbishment or a regeneration of their offensive power until June, that describes this, uh, then I would describe these offensives as failures because although they did regain some territory, they ended up using all of their offensive power in these offensives. And then when the Russians were in this weakened state, they didn't have the capability to then end it all there. So it was a success, but it was also a failure. Similarly to what the Ukrainians said when they captured Kherson, it was a more of a failure than it was a, of a success because the original objective, the number one objective was to encircle the Russian forces and then capture the city but they ended up capturing the city without encircling the forces. The Russians actually had very few casualties in the Kherson front. What has all of this have to do with what is happening right now? What is happening right now is that through looking at Western mainstream media, we can see that the general opinion of the West is that they're growing tired of this offensive. It has taken two months and they have essentially captured nothing. They have nothing to show for the amount of training they've received, the amount of equipment they've received, and how long they have taken. They can say all they want that it will take a long time. But a week ago, they said they started their main push. It will take one to three weeks. One week in, they've captured two more fields. That's about it. And quotes from Western media. We have Politico. Ukraine has deeply disappointed its supporters. We have the New York Times. The Ukrainian armed forces have le advanced less than 16 kilometers in two months. They claim that some Russian fortifications are impossible. And a German newspaper, due to its ambitions to reclaim all of Russian territories, Kiev finds itself in a precarious position. Ukraine's attempts to push back Russia seem unlikely to succeed. So we are seeing the West or Western mainstream media criticizing the Ukrainians for how the offensive is going. And in the meantime, we have this uh, rumor, allegedly from the office of the president in Ukraine, according to uh, this, according to the resident UA uh, telegram channel, their sources in the office of the president says that the Biden administration is rushing Zelensky with a second stage of the offensive which should begin with the crossing of the Dnieper in the west. They are not satisfied with the positional warfare in the Zaporizhia front. And according to their source, Yermak promised the Biden administration to launch the second stage of the offensive within a month. The date and place of the D-Day operation have not yet been agreed, but everything is ready to begin the formation of the Dnieper. Now, just for a second, let's explain why I use this source. So whenever there's an anonymous source, you can take their information with a grain of salt because this could obviously be a liar since it's anonymous but there is also the possibility that it could be someone working in the office of the presidency of the ukraine so this means that although we have to take it with a grain of salt there's always the possibility of it being true and taking this into consideration we have to look and explore the scenario in which ukraine launches an offensive across the Dnieper river for that to succeed there would be a objective of the Ukrainian forces. The main objective of the Ukrainian forces would be two parts. The first is to establish a beachhead 
across the river line and try to establish supply lines. And the second one would be to cut the supplies of the Russian forces. So essentially you would have to make some sort of passage across cutting the Kherson region from the Crimea region. So this would be essentially trying to establish a bridgehead across and then cutting off the two areas from each other. To achieve that, they would need a significant force and they would also need a lot of speed. At the same time, it has to be accompanied with the Russian forces prior to this being unable to rapidly respond. And for that, they would have to have some sort of distraction and have to pour the Russian forces as far as away as possible. This may be why we are seeing the first signs of the Russian forces being pushed back at Uladar. The Ukrainian forces are trying to attack in this direction. They are also increasing their presence in the Bakhmut area, maybe even possibly launching a major offensive in the Bakhmut area, or generally in the Ramevsky ledge or even at Robotine. All of this prior to a naval landing would make a lot of sense to essentially force the Russian forces to relocate from the Kherson region and across over to the positions here in the northeast. This however carries a huge risk because if the Ukrainian forces are unable to cut off the supply lines or establish a bridgehead then the Ukrainian forces are launching a suicide offensive in the northeast or if they manage to succeed but the Russians are able to actually push back the Ukrainian offensive and make it a failure and then return and uh, essentially destroy the bridgehead, then they would have just failed in both fronts. So there's a lot of risks carrying, carried with this. However, if they manage to succeed and cut off the supplies, they could encircle a huge amount of Russian forces and that would all be worth it. Not to mention the PR uh, value of this would essentially make the West very happy with uh, what the Ukrainians are achieving. So it's a kind of a huge risk, huge reward gamble. So what is the conclusion to all of this? It is the fact that the Ukrainians are planning something big because they are forced to do something big. Even if this rumor is not true, even if that is the case, if the Ukrainians do not receive some major success through this offensive, they are unable to justify continuing this war because they have spent over half a year training soldiers in the West, receiving Western equipment, planning this offensive and all of these things. And in the end, they have only managed to so far capture seven villages and not even properly reach the first formal line of defense of the Russian forces. So the Ukrainians need some sort of major victory, otherwise people will not have the faith in them. The morale of the Ukrainian forces and the people will dwindle and reach a bottom level from the start of this war to today. So generally, the Ukrainians are forced to achieve some sort of success, otherwise this war would essentially be over. And that is going to be all for this update. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe and check me out on Patreon and PayPal. On Patreon, I just released a video where I analyzed the losses of both sides in this war. That's going to be all for this video. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.